Well, we, I was trying to give everyone more time to come here. It's kind of great that you were here on time. But I uh, was trying to crash you on the But you just took it from somewhere. You find your way back here. But only in the middle of the third week of the school, but on the last day. You should be able to come here at 2 o'clock. Otherwise, But I also want to remind you, as I don't know, you know that tonight is going to be a public lecture at the John Ballet. If you want to do it, get to the next one from the Loa, which is now down to work. The Loa will be happy to do it. So I need to direct the Loa over there. So the lecture is set on the side. Okay, great. Um, so you're ready for more zero bias peaks, right? Um, by ways of recap of what we've been uh, discussing yesterday, um, here's a, once again a summary of uh, what was concluded in terms of signatures of Majoranas back in 2012, right? This is our reference point, and today we're going to launch into whatever happened since 2012. It's been already four plus years, so something must have happened, right? Uh, so um, zero bias peaks were observed and uh, they onset at a finite field as required by the basic Majorana recipe, right? Remember four ingredients, one dimensional band structure, nanowire, with spin orbit interaction, magnetic field, Zeeman effect, to break the spin degeneracy and to bring us to the spinless P wave superconductor and of course superconductivity itself, but of conventional type S wave superconductivity. And so magnetic field of about 100 millitesla was required to start seeing these features. Um, and then this peak was remarkable and distinct from some of the other zero bias peaks that I also showed you like Kondo and uh, things like that by virtue of the fact that it stuck really well to zero bias, right? So why is that remarkable and relevant? It's because uh, we are creating a topological phase, right? In the bulk of the nanowire. So most of the nanowire is supposed to be in this topological phase. And these Majoranas are the bound states of that phase. So uh, as soon as we enter that phase, the Majoranas are supposed to be pinned to the edges and pinned to zero energy because they're Majoranas. And so the fact that this spectroscopic feature was also pinned to zero bias was sort of consistent and um, we were also able to verify that spin orbit plays a role here because we were able to rotate magnetic field right and we align external field with spin orbit field at which point the degeneracy of the bands is restored because both fields are in the same quantizing direction so the degeneracy of the bands is restored and my Uranus is supposed to go away, and the zero bias peak went away. Okay. So these were the features that we discussed yesterday. And um, I also want, as a sort of a public service message, uh, promote to you the fact that for that science paper, all the raw data is online. In case you feel like fitting it or just playing with it, uh, it's in uh, this a bit specialized spy view format that was developed by some guy from Delft, a great guy, Gary Steele. Uh, we should probably have done it in a more conventional format, but we were just so in love with spy view. But you can basically download this package and scroll through the data, take line cuts, uh, uh, change these color scales if you don't uh, feel comfortable with the one we chose for the paper. And I encourage you to, I mean, you, you may not want to look back at this four-year-old data, but I encourage you to do this with all your papers, right? And go back to your advisors and tell them to insist on putting raw data online. Because think about it, how silly is that, that we take data, numerical data, actual data, data, and then we take, make a JPEG image of it and we post it online, right? That's very silly, right? We have all the, all the numbers in our computers, we should share them. And what we also do is, 
as experimentalists, we, we would take, you know, we have the, f the best data in the paper, right, which is uh, known as typical data, right? <laughs> uh, but that could be very misleading. So uh, put your second best data set in the supplementary and put your third best data set in the supplementary. If they're all three great, fantastic, that's really your typical. But if the second one is already, you know, a lot worse than the first, and then the third one is down here. That also tells the community something. You know, you, you still have discovered something, but it tells you other people how, how robust is what you've discovered and how hard it is to get it. Is it one sample and, and so on. So uh, do these things, please. Um, to take data or to... To, you know, oh, well stealing the data from online that already has your name on it uh, I mean <laughs> okay well yeah we know some people who can generate data in MATLAB uh, that's also no I think uh, yeah I think you should share everything with referee with everybody else but okay let's have that discussion over beer in the evening okay um, all right so um, and these are the things that uh, were consistently predicted by theoreticians uh, and were not observed in 2012, right? And we're going to talk about these things today, except for the first line, right? The, the two e squared over h conductance quantization we covered pretty well yesterday. And I'm just going to stick with my uh, claim that this is just a, a finite temperature effect. And we're not going to come back to this one anymore. Okay, so we're going to talk about observing the topological transition in the bulk, closing of the topological gap and reopening it to enter the topological state. We're going to talk about uh, essentially the question is where is the second Majorana? They're supposed to come in pairs, and if they're finite distance apart, zero bias peaks supposed to oscillate. And we're going to talk about mapping out this topological condition and uh, whether that's possible and what are the hidden uh, challenges there. So this is a slide I made some time ago uh, and it's still relevant kind of. So this is a um, sort of a free scale, scale free um, uh, assessment of uh, you know the, one of those you are here maps. And this was the data that I spoke with you about. And these are sort of the limiting uh, regimes of scientific uh, uh, certainty that you can reach. And uh, in particle physics, uh, you can reach this uh, remarkable five sigma accuracy, right? And you can be very convinced in your predictions. And this here on the sort of the wacky end of the spectrum, people make other claims. And, uh, and we are somewhere in between. And this is kind of where most condensed matter experiments fall. Uh, we can never be completely sure of our conclusions because we work with very complicated systems. And uh, the Hamiltonians we write are not adequate for the system. They don't capture everything. And uh, it's very hard to implement simple Hamiltonians. And this is the case that we have here. This is a simple Hamiltonian, difficult to implement it because other things get in the way. But we've made some uh, progress. And let's uh, get to it. Um, the question of gap closing will be the first one that we're going to discuss today. And so I remind you the picture from yesterday for how this topological phase transition is supposed to happen as a function of, for example, magnetic field. So you start with a fully gapped system at zero magnetic field. Uh, this is as a function of space here in these upper pictures. And then at a certain magnetic field, this gap closes. And that is the topological uh, phase transition point. And so there is no gap in the system anymore. And then if you keep increasing magnetic field, the gap reopens and leaves behind these two dots, which are the Majorana fermions at the ends of the system. Now this is uh, one of the data plots from Delft. And uh, the labels got lost, but this is just um, for you to have a qualitative idea. So um, field and source drain bias in microvolts are here. And uh, this is zero bias. Here is where zero bias peak emerges. This is what the apparent gap is doing, the one that we could see. 
there are some features here that kind of uh, come down, right? but those are not universal. They are here in this plot, but we adjust the gate parameters. This goes and moves to some other field, right? So this, this is not universal, much like this thing is not in a universal position. By adjusting gates, this big dramatic cross would move to another position. So they are not in any way topological or related to this. Uh, there's something else happening in a device related to this statement I made that the Hamiltonian is difficult to realize. There's always something else. OK, so the onset of the peak is not accompanied by at least this gap closing. And that is sort of a, a puzzle. If you try to calculate uh, what's supposed to happen, that's not what you see. Um, there are a number of scenarios that people proposed as to why this could be, right? To, to reason with this, to justify why experiment does not show the gap closing. And um, I'm going to show you just one of such papers. It's this paper from the Sarmas group. Tudor Stanesco is the first author. Because uh, it, not because it's true, but because it provides a picture that is, I find easy to explain. And so I, I use this paper. I don't have proof that this is what's happening. Okay? But this is what they're saying. They're saying that the gap is closing in the bulk of the nanowire, while Majoranas live on the edges. So those states that were gapped and become zero gapped, their wave functions are something like this like the red trace. And then the Majorana is something like this. Now, the way we do our experiment is we have a tunneling probe here at the end, and we tunnel into this point, right? And so what is the tunneling current that we measure depend on? It depends on the tunneling barrier height, the density of states on the probe side, on the normal side, but also on the density of states on the other side. And so we are more sensitive to whatever's on the edge than whatever's way down in the bulk uh, down the wire. Okay? So that's the idea. So here are the plots of local density of states, right? Density of states sampled at the end of the wire. Okay? X equals zero, which is here. But as I'm standing here, I'm going to point at this point. Uh, so local density of states, this is what it shows. Um, these lines are the gap edges, and they don't seem to move much. While a very faint, but I hope you can see, zero bias feature emerges here seemingly out of nowhere, just appears. Now let's look at the bulk. So x equal L over 2. So if L is uh, 4 and a half microns, it's right here. Local density of states sampled right in the middle of the wire. There we see a gap closing at the same spot where the zero bias peak emerges, right? So the zero bias peak, however, is not there or almost not there. I think if you really, really zoom in, it must be there. You may be sensitive to the little tail of it. But if you make the wire long enough, it is completely not there. So this is what their, this is what their claim is. Yeah? What's the measure of local well, so um, it's just the density of states at this position. Yeah. So it's yeah. So uh, it's actually the it's actually just the wave function, but uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so to, to, get the, to get the current, it's modified by the tunneling matrix element. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is, a, this is a, like I said, this not, doesn't have to be correct. But we could check it in principle, right? If we could make a tunneling probe that would go here in the middle, which is, which is I have to admit, is hard, but it's maybe possible. Uh, it's much easier with STM. If we could uh, move the tip around and tunnel here and tunnel here, um, then we should see this gap closing, at least according to this one theory. Um, and so 
We could, in principle, do that with these structures that we grew, or people, our collaborators at Eindhoven grew, uh, which are the nanowire crosses, right? So I want to show you this because uh, it's kind of awesome, but also uh, useful not just for this one experiment, but also for this braiding idea, right? So what is this? This is two nanowires that were growing in this MOVPE machine, right? Remember I told you they're gold particles and we flow gases, organic gases, and they start to grow nanowires by precipitating out of gold particles and pushing the particles like this. And so these wires grew at angles and they cr crossed each other and the particles kept growing and they formed this cross, which is a single crystal cross. And so it's a very high quality piece of semiconductor and allows us to go sort of beyond one dimension with these wires, which is uh, promising because uh, that's what braiding requires, right? Um, how many of you are familiar with this proposal? A fair number of people. Okay. Uh, question? Uh, when this paper came out, it was more accidental, but now they have developed a way to do it controllably. Um, so rather than growing on a flat substrate, they grow wires out of ridges. They put gold particles like this, and they position them in just the right way, a little bit offset from each other, and they make arrays of these crosses and even more complicated things like, like uh, maybe loops, right? A semiconductor nanowire loop, which can also be useful for braiding. So this is coming. We are not doing experiments with it right now, but this is coming. So this braiding proposal, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, uh, I'm going to quickly go through it. Uh, it's by Jason Alisea and collaborators. And uh, the, the challenge is to exchange gamma 1 and gamma 2, these two Majoranas, without them ever meeting. Because when they meet, they annihilate. My particle and antiparticle annihilate. Or you know, they collapse into one of the states with charge 1 or charge 0. So you have a third leg here. And so you take gamma 1 and park it in a third leg, then shuffle gamma 2 over and then take gamma 1 out of the leg and the tri-junction allows you to braid uh, in this you know, one plus dimensional system. So we can also use this, the third leg as a, as a tunneling probe, right? So this, we could actually test this in one of the future experiments. We could test the local density of states in the middle of the topological region uh, by tunneling from here into here, here, and here, and comparing we should see the zero bias peak on the, on the edges, and we should see the gap closing in the middle. We could check for this particular theoretical proposal. OK. But um, another reason why we didn't see the gap closing could be actually a more trivial reason. It's a kind of, kind of a experimental reason, and it's this soft gap issue that I already alluded to you uh, yesterday. It's the fact that conductance is actually not zero in the, in the middle of the gap. The gap, superconducting gap, should look like this. We can call it a U-shaped gap. So it goes down, maybe a little rounded here, and then goes up, and there's a very flat region, and you can see all the states that are living inside that gap. And instead, in the experiment, it's more of a V-shape. And uh, actually, there are maybe some states inside uh, already. And um, th th it's a very trivial thing. The problem that it creates for observing Majorana is that it uh, obfuscates what you can see. There is a background. And if something is happening in the background, for example, if there is a little gap closing and reopening, right? it's only one of three or maybe five or seven gaps that is supposed to do that, close and reopen. We may just not see it buried in this background. There could be a little feature shifting down and then moving back up, and we just don't see it. We don't have the sensitivity. So we would like to make this gap hard. We don't want it soft. And there are other reasons why this could be a problem. Uh, certainly, it's a problem for topological protection. So. Topological protection of Majoranas, I'm not going to actually talk about it today much, but the one thing you have to remember about it is that the entire protection 
is just a gap. You are protected by the magnitude of this gap, by the fact that there is one state here and there are no states until you hit the gap edge. And so the magnitude of the gap is the degree of your topological protection. If you have a, a one volt of a gap, you're protected up to room temperature. If you have a 100 microvolts of a gap, you're protected to one Kelvin. And if you have a, you know, 10 microvolts of a gap, you're protected to 10 millikelvin. Um, and so if the gap is soft, there are all kinds of states that the Majorana would hybridize with, and it's absolutely not topologically protected, which may not bother us for now, but it will certainly be an issue going forward. So um, why do we have this soft gap? Well, again, I refer you to the same group, the SARMA uh, group in Maryland, that published not one but two papers explaining this effect. And actually, remarkably, the titles are, you know, it's basically, maybe there's one word difference, but it's actually two different mechanisms. Right? It's two different mechanisms, and one of them is about the fact that uh, I believe that uh, the softness of the gap comes from coupling to the normal lead. So you have an ungapped density of states in the normal metal, and that's very close to the superconductor, and this tunnel coupling uh, it kind of fills up the gap. And the other mechanism is disorder. So how to understand disorder? Disorder, you can understand it this way. Um, we have an interface between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And uh, let's suppose this interface has some roughness. And so um, at each of these rough spots, the size of the gap might fluctuate, just because the tunnel coupling is different, the nanowire effective diameter is different, you hit a different grain in a superconductor. And then you average over all these fluctuating uh, gaps, and you get something that's blurred. So as if this is a convolution of a bunch of sharp features like this brought together. This is uh, one of these papers is about that scenario. And um, so we can kind of make uh, steps in improving uh, for both of these situations, right? We can cool down our normal metal and decouple it more from the superconductor. And we can also do something about this disorder. And this, it's this disorder that I'm going to talk about for the moment here. So I'm going to show you once again the picture of our device that I already showed you yesterday. And we're going to talk about this interface here now. Okay, So um, it looks kind of uh, gorgeous, I think, this picture, um, uh, especially the angle, uh, very artsy, right? But um, if you look closely at this interface, you can already see, even in this picture, that there is something not perfect here, right? And there is a, let's look at the superconductor side here. So there are different colors. So these different colors are different heights of the superconductor. So in fact, there is a pileup of material on the edge, which is an artifact of the fabrication process, because we actually coat everything with a superconductor, and then we rip it off where we don't want it. And so on the edge, there is this bead going around the edge, which is sometimes called the dog ear. And there's this dog ear that has a different height than the segment next to it. Um, now, that already looks like disorder, right? So it's possible that this creates problems. Uh, but even more important is what's happening right here where the metal, the superconductor, touches the nanowire. And bad things are happening there. So for that, you have to understand how we make the device once again. So Remember I told you we make these gates in advance, and then we lay down this wire, and then we you know, take a picture, find where it is, and then we design and deposit this metal. So the wire, it was in air before we did this, and so it grew some kind of a native oxide on the surface, some indium antimony oxygen combination of unknown stoichiometry and pretty thick. So if we just lay down this metal on the wire, there will actually be no current. The resistance will be tera ohms. So we have to clean it 
before we can make a contact. And the way we clean it is we put it in acid, or we put it in some crazy sulfur compound, or we actually bombard it with high energy ions to sort of scrape off the surface layer. Right? Yeah. How come you don't throw the superconductor all the way over the wire? Uh, that uh, that is uh, uh, yeah uh, so right so let let me okay yeah I can I can pause for this thought so the reason why it's half covered we call it half coverage is because if we fully cover it then these gates underneath have no electrostatic coupling anymore to the semiconductor you have to think about electric field lines going from the gates and most of them will hit this metal which will heavily screen the electric fields. And so by exposing half of the wire we actually increase dramatically the coupling and we can use these gates as control knobs to change the chemical potential more efficiently. Um, so indeed uh, you may say that by doing that we introduce extra disorder in let's say the roughness of this edge just the, just, the, just the shape of this line. But what I'm arguing here is that the biggest disorder is here at the, at the actual interface. So not the w waviness of this line, but down there in the interface. And so there is some chemical and even mechanical handling that is happening there. Uh, and that could be responsible for the soft gap. Okay. Um, well, uh, ultimately it's all gap disorder, but it can come from different ways. That could also be potential disorder that, um, you know, if the Fermi level energy is different, fluctuating along the wire, that could also result in different gap. Uh, but uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about this interface is sort of transmission disorder. Uh, that there's, what is also possible is that these beads and dog ears create a different gap in the superconductor as a function of uh, space. Uh, while I'm on this picture, I also want to tell you that, um, so this is a device that was made in Delft. We make now, both in Delft and in Pittsburgh, uh, similar devices now, but in addition to improving various details of fabrication here, we also made this gate dielectric a lot thinner and a lot higher uh, dielectric constant. So our gates couple much stronger now than they did in 2012. Okay, so this is going to be important for today. Okay, so um, actually something can be done in a very clever way about this interface disorder and this was pioneered uh, in Copenhagen in a group of uh, Charlie Marcus by uh, Peter Krogstrup who was the grower who grew this structure, and then uh, Chang, Albrecht, uh, and other uh, students in Marcus Lab did these wonderful measurements. Uh, so what they did is they basically said, OK, if the problem is this handling of the wire, and you put it out of vacuum, and you have to clean off the oxide, and let's grow it all in situ. So they have produced this kind of wire, aluminum on the shell, and indium arsenide in the core in situ, in one growth, in one machine, in one vacuum cycle. So this interface between indium arsenide and aluminum never seen air or chemicals or anything like that. So this interface is in fact epitaxial. And so it is possible because there is um, a very little lattice mismatch between aluminum and indium arsenide. Otherwise, there would be a lot of defects here and it would be back to square one the same disorder but for different reason um, and what they found is that uh, they were able to obtain this hard gap so this uh, blue trace is actually experimental measurement for epi epitaxial nanowire uh, and they made this you know similar device to what was done in delft here's a superconductor with nanowire and here's a normal probe there is a gate that is now not underneath but on the side um, and so they pinch off here and they tunnel from this yellow into this white. This is the shell of the nanowire. And they are able to obtain this gap, uh, which at zero field looks very, very hard. Um, and for comparison, they have tried to do the same, but 
without this epitaxial trick, but simply by evaporating aluminum on this wire, and they got the red trace. So also looks like a clear gap, but there is definitely some uh, background conductance inside the gap. So that's a soft gap. Um, now, this is the induced gap, uh, although it is also very close to the bulk aluminum gap. Um, and so that is also good news because that means that the coupling between a superconductor and a semiconductor is very, very good, maybe even too good, right? So we had in, with niobium a factor of 5 to 10 mismatch between the bulk gap and the induced gap, and here they are is identical. Okay. <coughs> So um, uh, this is extremely promising, and it's probably the way to go forward. We probably will all switch to epitaxial wires in a few years. Uh, there's still some work to do with these wires. Uh, first of all, um, in these early experiments, uh, you know, uh, the entire wire is coated with this material. But you need to put this normal metal somewhere. And so you have to remove the semiconductor. And you do that by etching. So you put it in acid. And so the same story starts again with disorder. Except there is no disorder here where the critical part for the topological part, but there could be disorder there. So they were suffering from making some quantum dots in this barrier. Uh, another problem is this is aluminum. And so you're very limited to what you can do in terms of applying magnetic field, right? Remember I told you the critical field of aluminum is very low. So here is an example, zero field to 80 millitesla, the gap is gone, right? It's a blue line. It's like the, the death, no pulse. It's completely flat line. There is no gap at 80 millitesla. And this is also indium arsenide. So the G factor is a factor of 10 less 10 or 5 less than an indium antimonide. So you need to go to actually not to 100 millitesla, but to maybe half a tesla to see Majorana. But you cannot even go to 100 millitesla. And certainly, the gap becomes softer and softer as you go. So 20 millitesla is softer, 40 is already softer, and 60 is quite soft. Uh, yeah. This is at uh, the lowest temperature. So the dilution fridge, whatever. <laughs> wh I don't know. We, you know, they have 10 dilution fridges. Yeah, it's millikelvins, yeah. Um, right, so that's the next point I was going to make. Um, uh, so I believe so, so this is along the axis, but uh, <coughs> you can improve this situation by making this shell very, very thin. So it's known that in thin films, critical magnetic field grows as thickness decreases. So if the shell is very thin, what you can think of is superconductivity will go away when you can put a flux quantum in the, sh in the film thickness. Okay. So if you make the film very, very thin, like 10 nanometers, you can actually make this superconductivity survive to you know, 10 tesla, uh, oh, sorry, 1 tesla and so on. Uh, but you cannot rotate the field. You can only apply it along the wire. As soon as you apply it out of the plane, then it's very easy to put a flux quantum in that situation. So there's only one direction where you can extend it to one Tesla and all the others are are less. So for you know for some for example for verifying that spin orbit is relevant, uh, this is hard. For braiding this is hard because uh, for braiding you need to have one segment going in one direction, another segment going in another direction. And so if you pick your field direction, the other segment will not be topological. Right? If you pick this to be topological, the perpendicular one might not be topological. So aluminum comes with limitations. Yeah. Yes. That's because we used uh, uh, niobium. Okay. So the gap, well, gap was soft, but it was... Uh, large and robust. So the source, semi, uh, the source superconductor that was proximitizing the wire would survive to 10 tesla. It would still be superconducting. And so it could keep supplying the gap to the wire. But, it, but the gap was solved. So, so maybe we need to keep exploring this, right? Maybe we need to try, you know, you can do some promising work with aluminum, but maybe we should also try something that's not niobium and not aluminum, some other materials. And we will come up with a combination that gives us Hard gap to large field. Yeah. 
Oh, you would benefit from it enormously, yeah. And uh, it's just that for this device, they didn't do it, but they also have a trick to half cover this wire. So basically, the reason why it's covered from all ends is because during deposition, they rotate the wire. So if they don't do that, they can cover one facet, two facets. It's actually a wonderful, very flexible method that they are developing there. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, but um, so epitaxy might be the way to go forward. Um, here I show you that it might not be absolutely necessary um, because sometimes we can also get a gap that looks hard or at least much harder than it used to with our method, which is ex situ. So this device was produced in Pittsburgh where we lay down the wire and then we deposit these two superconducting electrodes after the fact so we had to do some processing on this segment, but we optimized this process to obtain a harder gap than, uh, than you know, in 2012. So if you're curious, this is the recipe, and uh, at the very least, stare at this because to, to sort of appreciate and sink in what kind of chemistry and uh, processing needs to be done, right? So the first step is to clean. So there is some sulfur compound that you soak the wire in for half an hour. Uh, and then maybe we add a little bit of mechanical etching. And then we have, we found that you have to actually deposit this kind of stack, not just simply niobium titanium nitrate to get the, the best gap. Okay. And so what you're looking at here is because there are two superconducting electrodes, then these features come not at uh, one delta, but a two delta. And so it's one millivolt uh, is two delta, so one delta would be half a millivolt. And uh, it's quite low current here. You can see this conductance is already very low, and here it's even lower. Uh, and so you can see that there is nothing there, which, is, which was the whole point. Right. Uh, and you can even see that there, there are some extra bumps here inside the gap, which uh, is, would be something that we wouldn't have seen before. And so these could be some Andrea bound states or so. <coughs> this double uh, peak feature is an artifact of the measurement. And it uh, comes from the fact that there are two superconducting electrodes. I, I would rather skip this discussion. It's well understood what this is. And, uh, OK, so hard gap can help us. And so there's been a lot of this material finessing, fiddling with different recipes that took place over the last years. And many fields of physics go through these phases, like the superconducting qubits, uh, you know, first breakthrough demonstrations, and then a long grind to ramp up the coherence times to something interesting with little materials improvements. Uh, one improvement at a time. So maybe we are at this stage right now where we have to do a lot of tedious, careful materials work. Okay, back to physics. Um, now let's consider uh, what happens when the wire is a finite distance. So um, here is a nanowire. And there are two Majoranas at the ends here. And um, their wave functions uh, turn out to be some kind of uh, wiggly wave functions that <coughs> decay like this. It kind of reminds you of uh, RKKY uh, type, uh, type effect. Uh, and so if the wire is a finite length such that there is considerable overlap between these two, then you can apply your intuition for exchange interaction to these wave functions. Right? It's actually not uh, obvious to me because these are not just uh, fermions, they're Majoranas, they're, but this still works. This part still works. Um, and so if there is overlap between these two wave functions, then uh, instead of observing one zero bias peak, you're going to observe two peaks split from zero bias. Uh, and then if you're going to change the parameters of the system, for example, if we had a magic theoretical way of stretching the wire or shrinking it in situ, right? Uh, then these wave functions would come together or come apart. And because they are oscillating, also the peak splitting will oscillate. 
And so these are some of the simulations of this effect as a function of different parameters, the, the more realistic ones, the magnetic field, the chemical potential, which would also change the overlap of these wave functions and would produce these kind of oscillations. So um, here's one from uh, the group of Ramon Aguado, where here is the onset of the zero bias peak. And then you see kind of a single peak, but then a oh, little loop and then another one, and then one more. Uh, and you can also see the overall gap starting to close. Uh, so this is one of the early simulations. This one is maybe uh, a little easier to look at, again, from the Sarma group. Um, as a function of magnetic field or chemical potential, you have these oscillations. And uh, one interesting they predicted is that these oscillations ramp up. So they start smaller, and then they grow larger and larger. This is a theoretical prediction. Okay, doesn't have to happen in experiment. Uh, and the reason for that is because as, um, for example, Zeeman field changes, um, you have the effect that um, Majorana coherence length grows. And so this is because, for example, the fact that all the gaps eventually start to shrink with magnetic field. And uh, the coherence length of the Majorana is the inverse of the topological gap. So it's the inverse of the gap, proportional to the inverse of the gap. So gr gaps start to shrink. Coherence length starts to grow. So this oscillating function starts to stretch, and they have more and more overlap. So actually, the prediction is that the peaks will grow farther apart. And so uh, these oscillations were not uh, reported as uh, part of the original work, <coughs> um, except maybe in one of the supplementary figures actually showed uh, this data already in 2012, where as a function of one of the gates deeper under the superconductor, right? gate 1 is next to the boundary, gate 2 is deeper in. Here we change this gate. And these are the line traces at the arrow position. So here there are actually a, s a split peak. And here, this is a single peak. This is uh, analogous data from Pittsburgh as a function of magnetic field, as a function of gate. Here are two line cuts, um, kind of a single peak here. But then we change the gate, and it becomes a double peak. And here as a function of magnetic field, actually, by the way, look, looks like the gap is closing, right? This, these two states appear as if the gap is closing, and then the zero bias peak emerges. So maybe that's the topological gap closing that we were missing. Maybe now we can see it. Then the zero bias peak emerges. But then here, if you look here, it's a split peak. <coughs> so um, some peak splittings have been observed. That's the message of this slide. And this would be consistent with having two Majorana fermions a finite distance apart. Um, now, al also attempts were made to explicitly look for the second Majorana, right? So where is it? We can look at splittings of the peaks, but it's maybe a little indirect because we're still looking on this end and deducing something about the coupling of this state to something else. So you can design this kind of experiment, which is the, just a copy of the original experiment mirrored to this side. So make another tunneling probe here and try to find this Majorana on this end and try to find this Majorana on this end simultaneously. Okay? Look for the second Majorana. That's kind of a very logical uh, next experimental step. So this was done in Delft some time ago. Magnetic field is in the perfect orientation. The superconductor section in the middle. This is the superconductor. And N1 and N2 correspond to the two probes. And so the two graphs here, N1 to S, means that we tunnel from N1 to S. And the N2 is floating. And uh, this N2 to S means that we tunnel from N2 to S. And N1 is floating, so not participating in the current. And these are very stretched graphs, so you don't see the gap. But what you 
see and what they found in Delft was that um, in both cases at the same magnetic field the little zero bias feature emerged. So there was a sort of simultaneous onset of a zero bias feature on two sides of a device. So that's very encouraging, right? So you enter some topological phase underneath these three wide gates and as soon as you enter it, apparently at this field, zero bias peaks appear on two sides of the device. Right? So that was very promising. Then deeper analysis turned out to be a little complicated because both of these features start to oscillate. So you can kind of see here's a single peak, here's a double peak, here's a single peak, double, single. But those oscillations were not correlated. So this one would split, but this one wouldn't split at the same magnetic field. Right? So that hints at some complications. Why? Because, of course, if we had two Majoranas and only two Majoranas, then those oscillations should be perfectly correlated, right? When the two of these stars couple together, then peaks should split and the end of story. So if they are Majoranas, but they are not correlated in how they split, that means there are at least two more. So maybe like this, right? So maybe these are still Majoranas, but this is not a very simple regime, right? So there are, there are at least two topological regions with at least one break in between, and maybe more. Okay? And this is kind of where it's at right now. So there has not been further progress in these kind of tunneling experiments as far as things published are concerned, as far as I know, um, in terms of correlating these, uh, unless something happened in the last sort of, sort of months, which would be great. I think it's uh, Dave. <laughs> Is it Z or Z2? I think it's uh, Z, right? Two? I know that uh, the class that we are considering here is BD1, and there should be one Majorana. BD2, huh? I, I, I don't know. You tell me, guys. You've been listening about this for two weeks. Anyhow, I can tell you how many Majoranas, okay? There's supposed to be one Majorana at each end, no? Right, absolutely. You can have more in the middle, but on the end there is one. Yeah. And I think that's what the class tells you, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, sorry. Okay, so now I want to show you this experiment. This is from Copenhagen. So this is with one of these epitaxial wires. And uh, the green segment there is the epitaxial shell that they left on the wire. The wire, you can see it right where it says V source drain. This, is, this line is the wire. The green is the superconductor and all the gold around are normal metals. The, the left and the right one are source and drain. And these are uh, gates, so uh, this is a gate, 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 and this is source, and this is drain. Okay, so this is the device. And uh, you can notice this is a, a little different geometry because the superconductor is floating here. But they can still do transport from source to drain, which are both normal, through this superconductor. Okay? Um, and... Um, this is, a, this is a, however, a different system because uh, in the Delft case, this green part, the superconductor, is infinite size. And so the uh, charging energy of that superconductor is zero. It has infinite capacity, capacitance, and so charge, uh, charge energy is zero. Here it is actually a confined island because they can use this gate here 
to block off the island and they can use this gate here to block off the island on both sides. So the, the length L defines a confined island and that comes with finite charging energy. <coughs> and so when they sweep now this gate, they add electrons to this island by just simply overcoming the charging energy, one electron at a time. And so the, the diagram would then of this experiment would look like this. So there is a, a superconducting island coupled uh, to source and drain, coupled to gate. And uh, by changing the gate, you add electrons to this island one at a time or maybe two at a time if, uh, if the superconductivity on this island is very strong. Um, uh, however, um, there can be a Majorana mode on that island and to change the, um, the chemical potential by, by adding these uh, electrons from non-topological to topological would take many, many electrons. So many electrons would hop onto this island before it becomes non-topological. So with many, many, uh, adding many electrons would still probe the same quantum state. So then <coughs> what they did is they did a Coulomb blockade spectroscopy measurement. So this is still a tunneling experiment, but this is uh, doing a slightly different thing that the Delft did. Uh, as they change V-gate, they observe a sequence of such peaks. And I am not explaining this entire experiment. I'm just explaining what's relevant for the oscillations here. Uh, so they change V-gate and in current through this device, they see uh, this uh, very regular pattern of peaks. And these are Coulomb peaks, meaning that when two charge configurations with an extra electron and without are degenerate, then current is allowed to flow through the island. And in between the peaks, the island is in Coulomb blockade, which means that you have to overcome the charging energy before you can put electron on it. And so at, at low bias, that's not possible. Right? So this is a Coulomb blockade effect. This is a canonical Coulomb blockade effect, except uh, here they have a wonderful thing that at, at low magnetic field, they have this spacing between the peaks, but at high magnetic field above 100 millitesla, the spacing is half. And so this is due to the fact that at zero field with this aluminum, they have a very strong superconductor and they don't have enough, you don't have enough energy to break Cooper pairs. So you cannot put one electron on this island. You have to put two at a time. And so the, the periodicity in gate reflects the 2E periodicity. So you add Cooper pairs rather than electrons to this island. While at finite field, it becomes possible to add single electrons. Uh, there are two possibilities for, for why this is the case. And uh, one of these possibilities is that, uh, you know, superconductivity became too weak and it became possible to overcome this gap and you, you rather pay this remaining gap than pay the charging energy for two electrons and so you start adding electrons one at a time. The other possibility is that uh, this island has acquired a Majorana mode. And the Majorana mode allows you to put electrons on the island one by one. So Majorana mode on this island would make it a superconducting island with an extra mode that allows you to tunnel one electron on the island rather than Cooper pairs. Right? So Majorana, remember, it's like a box that can store one electron or zero electrons. And so as soon as that box gets generated, periodicity of the Coulomb peaks um, halves. Okay, so um, why am I showing you this now? That's because this group uh, has mapped out the oscillations of these peaks. So these are these plots here. So what they did is they um, took the positions of these peaks uh, and they averaged them. Um, so they took let's say this peak, this peak, this peak, this peak, they summed their positions and they took the lower peaks, so the one that splits this way, this way, this way, this way, and they summed over them. Uh, and uh, they obtained an amazing accuracy in determining the positions of these peaks. And so um, 
what this average measurement showed is that the position of this peak with respect to this peak as a function of field does this little oscillation with tiny, tiny amplitude of some microvolts. But they were still able to resolve it. So why should these peaks oscillate as a function of field? That's because of the Coulomb blockade spectroscopy uh, nature. So the spacing of the peaks is not just defined either by superconducting gap or charging energy. It is also defined by whatever quantum energy, uh, orbital energy, for example, uh, or Majorana energy, that you have to pay to add an electron to the island. And so if the two Majorana peaks are split, that means that adding one electron, uh, you have to overcome this splitting. And so the peaks would uh, show a tiny oscillation. So you add the first one to the sort of the lower of the Majorana states, and you add the next one to the higher of the Majorana states. Then the next one you add to the lower Majorana state again, and the next one to the higher Majorana state. And therefore, the positions will breathe a little bit um, as a function of gate, and this is what this, this measurement plots. Uh, they've made this experiment for islands of different length L. And what they say is that the longer the length, the smaller the amplitude of oscillation. So here is the shortest island, and here is a longer island. And you can see that you can barely see this oscillation. And these are the five devices that they've measured that uh, make this exponential decay uh, pattern from which they can deduce from this collective measurement some kind of Majorana length, which is about half a micron for this device. Okay. Questions about this measurement? OK, so this is, a, this is a very strong claim for observing Majorana oscillations uh, using this Coulomb blockade spectroscopy rather than just tunneling spectroscopy. And so in Coulomb blockade spectroscopy, you have to pay attention to the positions of the Coulomb peaks. That's the summary uh, of this slide. I would, yeah. Uh, so there are two possibilities, right? Theory is wrong or, or something else is happening. So OK, so one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that can reconcile both of these observations is, uh, is going to also be relevant for the, um, the subsequent discussion. So I'm going to sketch it here. Um, so what you just. Um, um, remembered is that I showed you this plot where the oscillations were growing as a function of, let's say, field, right? So magnetic field and the oscillations so, sort of would start like this, and then they're supposed to grow like this. Uh, now, in fact, uh, what we have to remember is that as a function of the field, superconducting gap uh, decreases. You know, not very important precisely which way it decreases, but the superconducting gap is decreasing. And uh, what it basically means is that uh, the entire spectrum inside the gap, so like this blue line, gets renormalized by the size of the gap. So you can say that, the that this peak height, the, the, the maximum splitting of the oscillations, uh, would be smaller if the same oscillation happened here because the gap is reduced. So the shrinking of the gap shrinks this entire curve. So if I plot now uh, the new oscillation in green, which takes that into account, then there will be not much difference in the beginning, but uh, there might be some discrepancy here because the gap has shrunk. Um, and this, this peak that's supposed to be high like this became like this. So this is a... This is one possibility that can reconcile. Uh, but I, you have to look, you know, so I basically made the three peaks kind of the same height, and this is what uh, this one shows, right? Uh, so for a certain decay of the gap, this is a possibility. Uh, yes, they have mapped it out. And I will show you some more data from their group. Uh, in a, in a couple of slides, yeah. So let's let's keep that in mind and and come back to this. Yeah. So I 
for Majorana here. I don't know. This is what the data showed, right? So indeed, I would expect it to be maybe higher uh, because this, you know, if spin orbit is the same as an in indium antimonide, which is what we found in Delft, uh, and the G factor is lower, then I would expect this to start happening at half a Tesla or so. And some of their other devices do show it at higher fields. Why is it the case that this happens at 100 millitesla? Well, one possibility is not Majorana, but it's just that uh, the gap became small and soft, and you start, it became possible to add electrons one at a time. Um, another possibility is that uh, one of the effects is uh, stronger, I don't know, larger G factor. You know, well, you know, this, this is actually not my work, but um, I know a good person to ask. I'm not going to put him on the spot now, but if you're curious, you can uh, talk to him after the lecture He's in the audience, one of the authors of the paper. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah. This is the, uh, this is maybe a different shell thickness, so uh, more optimized for uh, for these kind of measurements. And so definitely their superconductivity survives to higher fields in this device than in the one from the hard gap paper. Yeah. So they, they show data up to maybe one Tesla in this paper. Yeah. OK. Um, now I want to switch gears to the topological phase diagram. And um, I want to reflect to, uh, on the fact that uh, we, uh, in all the experiments I showed you so far, including this one from Copenhagen and the Delft ones and the Pittsburgh ones that I showed you, uh, we are doing this kind of uh, naive thing that uh, we don't really know what the chemical potential is and whether it's supposed to be in a topological regime. We just tweak these knobs like, like this boy, we tune the radio, we tune the gates, and then, oh, we find the zero bias peak, and then we start to compare it with various predictions for Majorana, like, right? Like in Delft, we try to rotate the field, and in Copenhagen, they try to map out the oscillations, and, uh, and it's all consistent with Majoranas. It looks uh, Majoranish enough to, you know, to go forward and say that maybe we found some signatures of Majorana, but wouldn't it be nice to actually know what's inside the black box and to set the chemical potential where it's supposed to be. So a quick recap of that is that we have this equation, right? That's the equation, the one I, uh, and only in my, in my two lectures, where the Zeeman energy should exceed this square root. And it makes this topological phase diagram where the colored regions are the regions which are topological. And what are these one, two, three? from yesterday, subband, right, exactly. So subband edges, um, and what happens to the subband edges in magnetic field? They start to split, and in between the split subbands and a certain offset from zero, given by that formula due to the delta squared, a certain offset from zero, this topological phase is supposed to begin. So with some improvement in this gate technology, we made these gates a little stronger. And now I believe we should be able to map uh, maybe three of these subbands. We are still limited on this axis to maybe go to maybe up to here, not too far in this direction. But uh, we can definitely <coughs> try to shuffle through the subbands. And what that means is that we should be able to see regions where zero bias peak onsets at fairly low fields followed by regions where it doesn't offset at all or offsets at very high fields. Right? So that simple fact was not observed in the original Delft paper and was not observed in the uh, Copenhagen paper, I believe. This not reported in the Copenhagen paper. And now back a little bit on the issue of the closing gap as well. So. Um, Let's say we can uh, shuffle our chemical potential and occupy three one-dimensional subbands, right? So these energy levels come from quantization in the cross-section of the wire, and the parabola comes from free motion along the wire. So now um, I told you that this 
band structure in one dimension can lead to this nice pattern of conductance steps, right, as a function of gate. Uh, but this is not what we expect to see in this measurement because we are not opening up the channel to have more and more modes transmitting through the wire. We have n modes, like one, two, three, and then we have a tunneling barrier in front of them. So we're tunneling into these parabolas. We have this tunnel barrier, right? So we're tunneling into these parabolas. And then what we're supposed to see, we already discussed, is the density of states. We're supposed to see Van Hove singularities from each of the subband edges. Okay? So maybe we should look for that. <coughs> and here's another point that I already iterated to you before, but uh, let's do it once again. Um, the gap that is supposed to close, that's only one gap at k equals 0 that is closing, right? Remember the beginning of the first lecture? These gaps at k Fermi don't close because spin orbit protects them. And gaps of the higher subbands don't close because they're at even higher momentum. So they're even stronger protected by spin orbit. So only one gap in the middle and only around the bottom of the subband the gap is supposed to close. And so to give you some relative spacing, in our nanowires we have measured this to be, let's say, 10 millivolts. Okay? So the spacing between these is 10 millivolts, and the kind of topological regimes we were creating are on the order of 1 millivolt. Right? So there should be a, a little topological region, and then a huge region with a non-topological, then maybe another topological region, huge region, non-topological, and so on. And if we are not in the topological regions, like we are here, then no gaps are supposed to close, ever, at any field. So here's some of the data from uh, now the Delft-style device where we tunnel, right? Uh, there is no island. Um, and this is a fairly large range of uh, gate um, that we can see here. And the data is source drain bias, right? Uh, you recognize this by now, I hope. And this is a zero magnetic field. You see here at zero bias, there is a well-formed gap everywhere at zero magnetic field. Now let's go to higher field. There is still a gap for most part, except near this resonance, it starts to blur. Let's go to even higher field. Still a gap here, no gap. And then still the gap here. So it looks like we found a very narrow region where the gap is closing and nowhere else, right? So that's uh, interesting. I just told you there should be a narrow region and gate where the gap is supposed to close. Um, and there is some kind of a large conductance feature going through. So that could be the Van Hove singularity of a subband. So that would be fantastic because that is now a telltale sign. We see something like this and they say, ah, Majorana is supposed to appear here. Not here, not here here. This would be the subband edge and that's where the gap is closing and let's let's play with this idea and let's kind of run with it. Um, so here is um, a zoom in on one of such features and so what you see here is now at zero magnetic field there is again a well-defined gap. Now we go to half a Tesla, no gap, zero bias peak, no gap. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, gap, zero bias peak, gap. So there is a finite region with a zero bias peak, but it's kind of small. And that's because maybe now the gates are stronger coupled. So let's park our gate here and sweep magnetic field. It's this scan here. You see the gap and it kind of closes, but it's still there. And up to one Tesla, there is no zero bias peak. Let's go to the right, the green arrow. Once again, at zero magnetic field, there is a gap, and then it starts to close, and maybe it just closes at one Tesla, but there is no zero bias peak. And then, of course, let's go to the middle. This is red arrow, and here you see a very long zero bias peak, 
unsets at a couple hundred millitesla and persists up to one tesla. So maybe this is a very coarse mapping of the topological phase diagram. Let's see the entire phase transition uh, in a movie. Because maybe we're getting tired, so let's watch a movie. Um, so let's see where the movie starts. Uh, now, gap starts to close, and then the state connecting through emerges and stretches. There is the region where it sticks to zero bias. Um, and so this is kind of a, some kind of a phase transition. Beautiful. I can watch it all day. OK, so these are the snapshots from that movie. And um, uh, once again, it shows the same thing. Gap, gap starts to close. The two states connect, and then they stretch. And then interestingly, if you keep going, it becomes kind of bent. And uh, one strange or, or not so strange feature of this data is that we only see one branch of the data. So due to particle hole symmetry, there should be the other branch. So for example, there should be a branch like this, but it's not visible. And so this is maybe surprising, maybe not. Various transport data is often asymmetric, especially when devices are so asymmetric. There is a one large barrier, and on the other side, it's very open to the superconductor. So these kind of asymmetric data often occur in these asymmetric regimes. But in any case, we only have the luxury of seeing one branch in this particular data set. So we can um, fantasize of what the other branch does. And so here, with this, with this buckle, with this S shape, maybe the other branch does something like this. And so maybe these are the oscillations of the peak. It's just that we see only one peak, not the other. But maybe it begins to oscillate. It also does what you expect with magnetic field orientation. Um, so, oh, sorry, this is just magnetic field sweeps uh, running ahead of myself. So now uh, <coughs> we do, we spark our gate at different positions, and we mark with pink arrows where the zero bias peak first appears. So you can see here it appears there, here, there, and here the arrow starts to move to lower fields at this gate, and then if you keep changing the gate, the arrow starts to move farther away. So the peak came down in field, and it came back up as we were changing the gate. And this is uh, the magnetic field orientation dependence. And so you can see that for the angle of 0 degrees with respect to the nanowire, there is a 0 bias peak. And for the angle of pi, there isn't. Actually, it looks like the gap is closing at this low field. And then at the dashed line where the zero bias is, there is nothing. So the peak seems to be oriented around the nanowire direction. And so the spin orbit check mark can also be uh, added to this data set. And this is the attempt to make a phase diagram where we plot now gate versus magnetic field. And these points mark from two different data sets the onset of the zero bias peak. So here, there's no zero bias peak, and here, there is a zero bias peak. And so you know, this is just here for comparison. It could be that we have mapped out one of these guys here, right? It looks similar. Well, uh, the full story is uh, a little bit uh, complicated because I was focusing on this uh, little part of the device here. And this is a larger sweep of gate. And by the way, this is gate one. Okay. And so um, I told you that maybe this feature is the Van Hove singularity, this one marked by N. And so we found zero bias peak around here. Well, there are other states uh, around here. And uh, they are occurring pretty often. And there are also zero bias peaks that are related to those states that appear at finite field. And so there are kind of too many of them to, to, for them all to be subbands. So maybe if this is a subband edge, the next one would be here. But there are some states in between that cross zero bias. And so that makes you think about uh, some kind of confinement effects underneath the nanowire. And maybe 
we are making not a quantum dot, but uh, something like a quantum box, because there is no charging energy here, but there could be still some volume where particle can bounce a few times and then go into the superconductor. So there are finite size effects. So how to think about um, states in finite size systems? So let's think about topological states in this finite size system. Um, well, um, this is the simple picture of that case. So here are the one-dimensional subbands. But if we confine ourselves also along the wire, we are only allowed to live on these dots, right? Very simple. Now we're confined in three dimensions, so we have a discrete spectrum. It's a zero-dimensional system. Um, and these are some simulations from Stanescu uh, that show what happens as the size of this box shrinks. So for a very long box, two microns, we still have a region of chemical potential or gate where a zero bias peak sticks to zero. And this is the sort of the topological, the lowest energy state inside the gap. This is what happens outside the gap. So this dense concentration of normal levels above the gap is the Van Hove singularity, in fact. And now let's see what happens when the wire shrinks. So the levels become more rare, energy quantization grows. There is still a bit higher concentration here. Now let's shrink it some more. There is barely anything. There is just this little um, tendency to stick to zero. And in ultra short segments, you cannot tell where the topological condition is satisfied. So I know that it's here because this is from the simulation. Right? It's here. But can you tell that it's not here from looking at the data? No. So these states, n and plus 1 and the ones in between, are very easily tuned with gate BG1. And that's the gate I've been showing you for most of the today's talk. But they are largely insensitive to gate BG2. So that tells us that they are confined to this area, which is about 300 nanometers. So that's in between these two regimes. So suggesting we are somewhere here. now. Theory can be off by a factor of 2, 100, I don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, let's, you know, we can assume that we are, these finite size effects should play some kind of a role, right? Or uh, by the very minimum, the two Majoranas are supposed to be sitting on the sides of this one gate BG1, which is 300 nanometers. OK. <coughs> now let's, um, let's do a, a quiz. It's fun. Uh, so this is my lab. And there are some dilution fridges, the ones I told you about. This is one fridge. This is another fridge. And there was a moment a few months ago when both of these were cold. And in both of them, we were measuring on these nanowire devices. OK. And so however, one of the two Majorana uh, one of the two nanowire devices was for sure not a Majorana experiment. We designed uh, some other experiment, not a Majorana experiment. And one of these data sets is from that not Majorana experiment. Right? Left. This, not Majorana. OK. Any other ideas? Everybody thinks it's left? Why do you think it's left? Uh, choose one, because they're the same, right? I guess that's the point. Well, uh, they're not quite the same, right? Uh, there, is, uh, there are some differences here. Right? Can you see the differences? Scale, right? The field scale is different. That's one thing. Um, so um, in fact, uh, this one is not Majorana. This is uh, Andreev states in a quantum dot. And this one, um, to be fair, it was made to look like this. For example, this offshoot here is one of those accidental states, like I told you before. So by changing the gates a little bit, this guy can be moved to another position. And so while these split uh, in a wide range of parameters, so these split, Zeeman split like that, and this one just made to look like this. And this peak sticks to zero for quite some distance, right? Uh, this is uh, about half a Tesla, while this is 
just a couple tens of millitesla. Uh, so, but nevertheless, it's remarkable, right? Uh, the we produce a state that kind of looks very similar. Yeah. You said it lasts forever, but compared to the splitting, let's say, regardless of absolute value, in comparison to the other bits. So, why, why uh, so I guess you should compare this to this uh, and convert both to energy, so right? Uh, no, I think what's important here is, well, I guess, yeah, because you can, you know, stretch this axis quite a bit, and make it look like it sticks for a long field range. Yeah, so, so what's the original stereotype? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you now, yeah. Okay, so the origin of this non-Majorana uh, state is uh, trivial and drave levels localized to actually in this case it's a quantum dot so the system looks like this superconductor and next to it a quantum dot coupled by a coupling gamma to the superconductor and uh, this is a well-known piece of physics uh, at least at zero field there is not that much data at finite field but at zero field what happens is the lead the s lead uh, has an induced gap in it and due to this gap there are states induced inside the quantum dot within the gap and there are these um, kappa resonances um, eta resonance what is this letter most um, which one theta okay great so these ones are andreev bound states so you can you know quasi classically think of them as um, electron goes in hole comes back and that makes a standing wave but um, no, there is a uh, proper quantum mechanical treatment of this. And so people observed <coughs> transport through such Andreev levels. So if you put, if you now hook up a normal lead on the other side, so this will be the normal lead, and you probe this dot with a normal lead, what you're going to see is that you will be able to add a particle to this level at the bias it corresponds to the energy splitting of the two. So what you'll be probing with this N to S transport is transition from the ground state of the system to the excited state with one more particle and that energy is this letter. So the energy difference between Andreev levels. Um, so this is what uh, this looks like as a function of gate in a very strongly coupled quantum dot. So when it's very strongly coupled to the superconductor you see this Andreev resonance. This is roughly where the gap is. And inside the gap, there is this winding uh, level that is an Andreev state. Now, what happens at finite field is that the excited state splits. Zeeman splits. So now you start seeing two resonances. And this is what these two guys are. So one of them goes down in energy, and one of them goes up. At some point, they cross at zero energy. And normally, they should continue like that. They should cross and keep going. But there is also this gap closing effect. right? There is this gap envelope that I told you about. And so this gap is closing, and it is pushing these levels together and makes them stick to zero bias for a little bit longer than they're supposed to. So they're supposed to go like this, but they're sticking to zero. And so this is just an illusion that they are at zero. In fact, there is a small difference between them, and just the closing of the gap pushes them together. It makes it look very much like Majorana. So uh, that data was from Pittsburgh, but we were not the first to report this. There was this wonderful paper, which I would argue is the most important paper since 2012 in those papers. Uh, that uh, have observed for the first time the Zeeman splitting of these Andreev bound states. Uh, and these are the, um, uh, the various, let's just, because there's no time, let's just look at the pictures, right? Let's not think about what these states do. Uh, it's suffice to know that these are not Majoranas. Uh, and so let's look, for example, at this one, right? So this is similar to what I just described to you. Uh, 
there is a pair of states at finite field and they are kind of, they're supposed to Zeeman split, but they are both kind of rounding and winding down back to zero bias. And the lower pair gets there first and makes this zero bias peak that sticks. Here's a situation where um, this doesn't happen. The gap just closes. So that's for an inverted um, ground and excited state. So that's also possible. Here's a situation where they do what you more expect from Andreev bound states. Like I told you, they Zeeman split and then they just cross through, but then they um, bend back because the, the overall gap that is not visible here is nevertheless closing and it pushes them back and those uh, become not so visible. So this is actually a formidable effect. And uh, for, this, for this plot, they, they plotted one of their data sets with these Andreev levels splitting and making this zero uh, bias peak stick to zero uh, in a trivial regime. They plotted it in a very malicious way with this 3D uh, color scale. And it's malicious because there was this other paper from uh, Weizmann Institute and you see these people chose the exact same angle uh, <laughs> to show this. And uh, if you look closely, there is a, a pair of states that merge here and maybe even split a little bit. And there are even these offshoots that are barely visible in this data presentation, but they are definitely there, the offshoots that go out uh, to, the, to the sides, okay? So, be very careful with these Andreev states. Now let's look once again at the Copenhagen data. So here I'm showing the oops the uh, Grenoble data, the Lee paper, what I already showed you. Here are scans from that island experiment from Copenhagen, from that nature paper. <coughs> so this is a finite bias scan as a function of field. And look at these states. So they are crossing each other several times. Here you can see two states coming together, making maybe a little loop, but the overall gap is also closing. And this is the longest wire. So here they have uh, something that sticks to zero bias for a while, but also the gap envelope is closing. So, you know, you can stare at the details of these plots and uh, think, that this looks more like Majorana, this looks more like Andreev state, but is that really satisfying? Don't you want to have a bulletproof yes or no? Of course you do. And so there's still some work to be done. Okay, so um, still on this uh, wonderful Grenoble paper, uh, now this is what happens as a function of gate for different fields. And I would like you to look at um, a sequence of plots, so I don't have time to describe all of them, but let's just look at this one. So here, two Andreev levels form this concave uh, shapes, and at finite field, they start to Zeeman split, so this is 0.2 Tesla, and at 0.4 Tesla, they, the two branches just touch to make this zero bias region. Now let's look at Pittsburgh data. What do we see? So we see only one branch, but we see kind of two concave shapes, right? Well, we don't know. I just presented it to you as my Rana data 20 minutes ago. So now we're looking at the same data. Um, yeah, so, you know, what if it's like that? So what if it's... Um, the two branches do this, and here they do something like this. And uh, these are just some Andreev states. So the only thing that uh, makes me uh, um, think that th this could be uh, still Majorana is the, r the, the range for which it sticks to zero bias, and the field scale of these features is a few hundred millitesla in indium antimonide is a su substantial range. And so you could say that uh, let's give Majorana a chance in this device because of how long the peak sticks to zero bias and doesn't want to leave. You know, the g-factor is huge, but it wants to stay at zero bias. And the gap is still there. And then uh, 
there could be some merit to this. So for example, here is a, a slightly different device, uh, but very similar. And here we found some accidental quantum dot and uh, found such data where here is a gap. And then at some field, we have this um, touching branches. And then it makes this loop. And um, as you do field scans, you see the two states coming together and uh, sort of dancing around zero bias. But if you change the gate, this is not robust. So as soon as you change the gate, it becomes a crossing. Uh, the, the crossing position moves wildly with gate uh, just because you're mapping this, this point and the, the two loops crossing each other uh, move very rapidly through, uh, through gate space in field. And so this is definitely a pair of Andreev states that are crossing. And there is no sticking here to one Tesla. Okay, so zero to one Tesla, nowhere does this peak sticks. And so the data I showed you originally in w large range of gate looks like this. It sticks to zero. So this, this one is a, some very special point where we are around this crossing. And so for one point, this is possible. Okay, so I'm supposed to stop here. Um, and so I don't have time to talk about the fractional Josephson effect. There has also been some experiments on that. Um, so I suppose I should uh, leave that out. Um, but I'm just going to tell you uh, what other things you could do, right? So at this point, the message uh, sounds like, OK, the, the transport measurements are messy and complicated. And that may be, and though we still try to improve them with better devices, better technology, and more thinking. The good news is that, uh, remember that Cheborashka effect, the unknown paranoid effect that looks like Majorana but is not a Majorana? Uh, well, maybe this is it. Uh, maybe this is the one, but this is the last one. We ruled out everything else. And this one has a name. It's not Cheborashka, it's Andreev bound states. And so if we find a method to rule this one out, we're done. We can tell Majorana apart from trivial Andreev state localized at the end, and we're done. So it's, it's not all um, so pessimistic. Actually, I'm very excited that we are learning about these Andreev states so much. But you could do other things. And this is uh, uh, incomplete, but uh, um, sort of commonly cited list of things that you can do. And um, the first one on this list is um, fractional Josephson effect that predicts that uh, Josephson effect, which typically has a periodicity in a phase difference of 2 pi, would become 4 pi uh, if you have two Majoranas across the Josephson junction. Um, and um, this is a great effect. I have a few nice slides about that. Uh, the message of those slides is that, first of all, uh, you may not see the fractional Josephson effect in a topological junction for dynamics reasons. You may see fractional Josephson effect in the trivial regime for dynamics reasons. And so what kind of a definite proof is that? I'm not sure. But in combination with other evidence, this might be a great tool to additionally verify that you have Majoranas or you don't. Right? So it, it, we definitely want to do this experiment. But this is not a standalone proof experiment for Majorana. Uh, there is a, something to do about non-locality of quantum Majorana states. So you put one electron in a wire and you kind of um, need to do something to verify that it goes non-locally on both ends of the wire at the same time. Right? So not the correlation of peak splittings, which is a DC measurement done with millions of electrons, but just put one electron and prove that it goes to both sides. And so you can do versions of this Liang Fu teleportation experiment, which maybe he'll tell you about next week. Uh, or you can do some kind of correlated measurements at the, at the fast scale, like a shot noise or a thermal transport. So uh, Majoranas cannot carry charge, but they can carry heat. So there are some predictions there. Um, you can do go towards qubits and towards braiding by explicitly controlling uh, Majorana occupation, reading it out one at a time, fusing Majoranas, and ultimately doing braiding. Um, my current feeling is that I wouldn't embark on these experiments until I know that for sure that I have Majoranas and how I can make like 10 of them 
right? So now I'm still trying to control one. If I know how I can make 10 of them, I would embark of th on these. There is another way to phrase it. I don't think these will provide sort of smoking gun evidence for my Arana if they're just done alone without all the previous experiments giving you check marks and strong check marks. Okay, so start with simple experiments and do baby steps towards uh, Majorana. So this is my last message. I'm going to flip through my beautiful uh, slides and leave you with this. So there's a lot of talk about smoking guns in this field, and these are water pistols, by the way. Don't be frightened. Uh, but the idea is that if, if too many people, and there's been over a thousand papers that came out since 2012, if too many people say, we found a smoking gun, uh, you're going to have this kind of situation, right? And uh, you will not be able to see anything. So with this, I, I, I finish my lectures. Thank you very much. Yes, I care. So I care about uh, basically, um, you know, spurious signals or accidental signals looking like braiding without actually being braiding. And so, and I cannot prove it to you because nobody has tried braiding. But what we have seen so far is we find some piece of data and we say, well, this is my Arana for sure. And then, you know, in a couple of weeks, a theory paper or even an experiment appears that says, ah, oh, actually, you can you know, see something like this in a trivial system. And I'm just extrapolating this trend to the more complex experiments. So fractional Josephson effect is a great example. It's not even been done yet. Well, now there are a couple of measurements. But there were already discussions of how it's not going to work as a, as a smoking gun, right? So Kitaev put it in his paper. But then people have said that you can have some landau zener transitions that can mimic 4pi and that can also kill 4pi in a topological regime. Uh, so just continuing this trend, I'm, I, I just think that you're going to build a very complicated circuit which will have 100 control knobs and there will be a regime where you tune blindly those control knobs to make it look like you have performed a non-abelian operation. Just the signal will look that way. But has the quantum state that you performed uh, the operation on really had that non-abelian statistics, or is it just a, sort of a fine-tuned parameter set? There will be no way to tell. Depressed? <laughs> No, it's good. It means there's more work to do. But just, you know, hold on until we get to braiding. It just take a little longer. Thank you.